keep your eye on what's going on with the digital yuan. This is no small uh, news snippet. This is the real deal, and it's a big deal. And uh, ultimately, I think could could reshape the way that uh, the world does business. Physical silver and gold in your hands. Personal service, competitive prices, and zero complaints. That's Miles Franklin. Call us at 1-800-822-8080 or email us at info at milesfranklin.com. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with the Miles Franklin Market Update. And back with us today is our president, Andy Sheckman. Andy, thank you so much for joining us today. Elijah, it's always wonderful to hear your voice. Good to be back. Definitely. It's, it's great to talk to you. Now, this week was pretty exciting. I mean, really since the beginning of April, we've seen precious metals uh, continue higher and rally. So what do you think this, uh, this means for the metals markets right now? You know, Elijah, uh, to me, the rallying that we see is every bit as inconsequential as the declines. And I don't mean to be trite when I say that. I mean, the micro movements to me are not the important thing. We all expect it to move much higher. Ultimately, it will. To me, it's more of a macro perspective. And uh, I think the market has great volatility. And if you look too closely at the volatility, you're, you snap your neck. And I think it's important to take a step back and realize that, you know, things are never as great in the market as you think they are when they're going to the moon and they're never as bad as you think they are when they're crashing. And when I say going to the moon, I mean in a very micro perspective. There are fundamentals and instances that push and pull the market in different directions back and forth. But to me, it's the ultimate trend, the ultimate direction of the market, the primary trend, if you will, the way that the river flows, that is the most important thing for me to gauge. And uh, so while I'm encouraged by, don't get me wrong, by a uptick in the price of gold and silver, I realize it comes with a grain of salt in the respect that this game or this battle is not over and it's it's uh we will see great volatility as we move further i i really do believe that the bull wants to take as few people along for the ride as as possible to me what the real difference is elijah the real difference is that in years past when the price would fall they'd step on its neck and it would never come back up for a long time in fact it would continue down in earnest now it's been a uh, a, a nice correction since last August. We've retraced, I don't know, in, in gold anyway, uh, pretty close to 50% of its movement. And that is typically how bull markets work. They, they, they run up, they retrace up to 50%, and then move further again. And, and this is something that I've seen over and over and over and over again. But to me, the fundamentals behind it, what we see coming off of COMEX, the tremendous amount of a metal coming off a of COMEX. Uh, last time we talked, I had talked about just in the first two days of the April futures contract delivery month, 20,000 contracts were delivered, 2 million ounces of gold. Um, when you look at the amount of silver delivered in March between SLV backdooring, exchange for physical off of London and, and metal taken off a of COMEX, it was over 150 million ounces. The biggest money in the world is using the misdirection uh, related to price to corner, I think, the, the, the lion's share of physical metal. And um, I guess all I really have to say is is that don't be driven by emotion, whether it be up or down, and take a more measured approach. Look at the macro perspective. Look what the biggest money in the world is doing. And I think everything will just be fine. It's like the, like the in the end, the tortoise and the hare, uh, you know, Last year, gold did the same thing. And, and, and when I say gold, I mean silver, too. There's whipsawing, but in the end, you know, gold finished up 35%. Silver finished up 50%. Those movements will happen, but more importantly, I think the trend, the macro trend on many levels is certainly, certainly in a very, very bullish formation. Do you see more downside potential for precious metals uh, before we start our next leg higher? Yeah, I mean, I think it's possible. It, it is always possible. It oftentimes has me uh, uh, befuddled, so to speak, when we see uh, uh, markets 
fall down when there are a million different reasons why it should be moving higher. And um, I, I've grown accustomed to understanding that this is a high stakes game, Elijah, uh, and that the big money um, will do all they can to not be crowded out of the position to try to defend the Western Keynesian fiat system. But the only way that it can successfully be manipulated is to push it in the direction it's going. And there's been an awakening globally, an awakening not only by us gold bugs, but also by the public at large uh, and, and the younger people. And uh, that awakening is, is uh, igniting, in my opinion, igniting a, a wave of demand that ultimately is going to push the price higher. Uh, could it fall further? <clears throat> sure. Why not? I guess it could. But I, I think one of the things that I don't think makes it really it, it makes it really not very plausible that it's going to stay down much longer than than just a snap down would be the fact that the demand physically is off the charts. And when you see the amount of buying that is coming from the top on down, uh, it 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 really to me doesn't portray for a, a long protracted decline. Uh, I guess what I'm really getting at is that just like your initial question, what do you think of the upswing? There are a lot of, a lot of um, uh, instances over the last several years where the market just gets smashed like February 1st and 2nd. Um, it, it, it will come back because the demand is not able to, uh, I think, or the supply rather, is not able to handle the the increasing demand that we're seeing which really would would uh make a a a big decline um very unlikely and as we see now one thing to to mention about that uh premiums are really high and you know one of the things i was talking about for weeks and i got a lot of heat from it on other youtube channels was the us mint closing they're closed right now if anyone hasn't noticed i was right person who told me was right they haven't produced a coin in a few weeks and um it could be a few more weeks before we see maybe even into the summer before we see more silver eagles coming out um with premiums as high as they are across the board if you see the price dip you'll see the bargain hunters flock in mass and you will see premiums go higher than you can imagine and availability uh, and delivery delays really really take hold so uh, I guess all I'm simply saying is that I hear again, I don't look at the micro side of things. Maybe I should, um, but I see a much bigger picture where, to me, physical possession, bird in hand, if you will, is, is worth an awful lot in the bush in an environment where it is ridiculously hard to continue to get stuff coming in the door. And you see the price drop. Uh, oftentimes, at least most of my career, that has come with far more demand than when the price rises people the bargain hunters come out and you can't find anything at reasonable premiums for more than a few days and when that happens within a few days typically we see premium slingshot product disappear and long delivery delays um, become part of the the norm and and i'm dead serious on that uh so i guess what i'm saying is i, I wouldn't be concerned one bit about a pullback even if we do, um, it's not justified. The demand will outstrip it. Uh, and I, I think the premiums would make anyone waiting for that pullback regret doing so. Not only the premiums, the delay in, in getting the product. And with respect to the current demand we're seeing when, you know, this month as we're seeing a rally, has, that, has the demand changed at all, increased or decreased as we see the prices rise? Uh, well, we've had four months in a row of record sales as big as anything we've done in, in 31 years. Um, and we're not an online company. I would argue if we had online capability, we'd probably doubled what we did. There are a lot of people who don't want to call someone and talk to them. While I believe that is the best thing to do overall, a lot of people would prefer the ease of clicking a mouse. I think that comes with its own set of circumstances. We are somewhat acquiescing, as I've been saying lately, in building a new website that will have the ability to do some online purchasing and show some prices. But 
here again, I guess all I'm simply saying, Eliza, is that from a retail level, demand is as strong as it's ever been, ever. February 1st and 2nd and 3rd, that first week of February might have been the craziest I've ever seen, 31 years, ever. Uh, February was our biggest month ever. Uh, but, you know, four months in a row on par with what we saw in February, not quite as high with the, you know, the, the Reddit folks coming on the scene and all the focus on what was happening with GameStop and AMC. And I think, however, that we are witnessing a much greater groundswell. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of people converting unallocated accounts to us, to our allocated brings programs or taking possession. Really actually startling. Uh, in the last two days, over 200,000 ounces of silver were switched out of unallocated into our allocated programs. And, uh, you know, getting a large amounts like that's not really easy. They come with, you know, three-week delivery delays or something and buying, you know, large percentages of allocations by the mints. People are fortunate that we're still able to do that quite frankly. But that's one of the things that, that people aren't talking about enough is what will happen when people wake up to the risks associated with synthetic unallocated programs. These unallocated programs are, are a problem. And I think people have a bad inclination too often to be penny wise and pound foolish. You should never do that with your assets. You know, it's one thing to try to get a a real good deal on some steaks at Costco, maybe buy four more than you really want. But it's another thing to try to take the, the cheaper road when it comes to segregated and allocated versus a synthetic unallocated program where you know, storage is nominal or, or free. There's nothing for free in this world. And I think that when you talk about the pitfalls there, there aren't pitfalls until there's a pitfall. When you don't need to take possession in any expedient fashion or expedited fashion, rather, then it's fine. But what we're seeing now are people who want it now, and I'm getting dozens of emails a week from people who are saying, I am being told six, nine months or not at all. And if you need your stuff and you're told nine months, what good is a free storage account? in an unallocated position if you can't get it with any of our programs storage. It's segregated, it's audited, um, and it's available to be picked up five days a week, in most cases unannounced. In our Brinks programs, 24 hours notice, just because Brinks has such strong security protocol that they need to, uh, to make arrangements for people to come in and get the license plate and their driver's license and the make and the model of the car and so they can be waiting for them. But short of that, um, I think what we're, we're seeing is a large, a large increase in demand centered around uh, people moving out of unallocated programs into segregated, allocated, or physical delivery. And, and that's going to put a lot of heat on this market too. So demand is off the charts, Elijah. And more than anything, it's, it's facing – an awakening that I've never seen in three decades, an awakening by the mainstream to um, the value associated with historical money uh, and having possession of it. This is something that a whole segment of the population has never thought about. Now, all of a sudden, to my, uh, to my surprise and, and to my pleasant surprise, uh, is now really becoming engaged. So, I don't think we've seen anything yet, Elijah. I truly don't. Now, one last topic I'd like to discuss with you is the uh, kind of the macro view again. This really plays into that where we're seeing um, a move from a lot of central banks around the world to consider digital currencies. Now, kind of the furthest along in that process is the Chinese, uh, the People's Bank of China issuing this digital yuan. How do you think this movement from central banks and especially the People's Bank of China will kind of impact the macro picture and ultimately precious metals? I think it will be the biggest thing affecting everything moving forward. I mean, you can talk about the loss of privacy where everything is on a ledger, the loss of complete and total loss of anonymity. I've been talking about that for over a year with you and your father and others about, you know, in March of uh, 2020, Nancy Pelosi and her House Subcommittee Finance Bill called for a, a digital dollar because evidently COVID supposedly could live on paper currency. 
I truly believe it's coming. One of the reasons may be that they haven't put the kibosh on things like Bitcoin, like Turkey did. And that's one of the reasons we saw it fall so fast is because they want people to be okay with digital currencies, to kind of indoctrinate them, if you will, into uh, the belief that that all digital currencies are are safe and, and what have you. I think that we could see a problem with the value of cryptocurrencies, not the central bank currencies, but you know, I see Biden is talking about a, a, a 43% capital gains tax. You, you look at somewhere like California or New York, you're talking almost 60% tax when factored against capital gains and state tax. Anyone who's got lots of profit is going to bail long before that happens. But he's talking about it. It's in zero hedge today, and that's real. And it's also asinine, uh, and it will destroy a lot of markets, including the crypto markets, and if people don't get out uh, with, you know, that's a that's a 20 plus, per, almost a 20% difference in, in return when you're talking nearly doubling the capital gains rate, which is just to me befuddling. Uh, but as it pertains to the Chinese digital yuan, I believe it's, you know, I, I've been saying that Basel III was the biggest event in my career. I may change that to this in that you have 70% of the world's population being connected by China through this new belt initiative, belt road and rail. Um, Not just by roads and bridges, but digitally. We've we've talked about what that means for silver. We also should note that the Chinese have been importing north of 10 tons a month of gold for years. In 2019, it was several times that. But on average, over 10 10, 10 tons a month, they're the largest producers and importers of gold in the world. They hardly sell an ounce anywhere. Um, at some point, I think they will back this new digital yuan by gold, but not until the dollar really shows itself as being in a death row in, in, in the, the, um, perhaps the inflationary spiral downward. And maybe then they'll come out and say, well, we're going to back this new digital currency with gold. It won't be redeemable. Like I've been saying all along, I thought the U S would do it too. Ultimately, I think they will, uh, with the fed coin. But they won't make it redeemable like it was in the 30s. Uh, they'll make it pegged and with a distributed ledger showing the the uh, the veracity of that peg. But look at it this way. I think it's the biggest, this particular, I'm not really opining on digital currencies as much as I'm talking about the Chinese digital yuan and what it means to this country. They're connecting 70% of human population nearly. Almost 65 to 70 percent, 40 to 45 percent of global gross domestic product. Uh, And they're settling all of these contracts outside the dollar in the new digital yuan. So think about that for a moment. Not only are you usurping the dollar as a settlement vehicle, which it has been pretty much exclusively for almost 80 years, but now they are they're doing the, the, the most ambitious uh, infrastructure program, putting the the um, Panama Canal to shame, uh, settling amid all these contracts in digital yuan, and teaching 70% of the world population that, hey, here's a new currency that will ultimately, I believe, challenge the dollar for singular world reserve status. And if it became very evident that the dollar's days were numbered, that the inflation that is being literally rain down upon the dollar, eviscerating its value. When that becomes obvious and it starts to spin out of control, and I think we will see that at some point, uh, regardless of the fact that we're fighting the deflationary forces of the globe, they're fighting it with massively inflationary policy that will have an effect on the value of the dollar. And, and when that happens, when you see that, that Rubicon crossed, where there's no way back, we, you know, some could argue we're already there. Um, I think the Chinese will, will will pull out the ace and say, well, we've been accumulating gold for years. We have north of 20,000 tons, three times what the U.S. is supposed to have. We're backing it by gold. When that happens, it's all over for the U.S., at least in terms of our standard of living and world reserve status. And um, I really do believe that on many levels, it's a foregone conclusion that we will see digital currency in the U S they want it, not just to 
keep their thumb upon everybody, know where, where everyone is spending their money, where if you lose 10 bucks playing around to golf with your buddies or 50 bucks playing poker with your buddies or try to pay the babysitter or, or the, the, the cleaning lady or whatever it may be, no, there's no longer cash. It's all on the ledger. Yeah, that's, that's one bonus for, for a government that seems to be hell bent on, uh, on uh, monitoring and, and um, paring back civil liberties, but more so in a, a government that wants inflation, that wants to be able to, at least right now, get money to the people without it being lent into existence through its, its current existing framework. Uh, and when that happens, that's when the inflation spigots really open up. When the, the commercial banks are not responsible for lending it into existence, the central bank will be responsible for spending it into existence. So I guess the bottom line is I think, you know, some people wonder why cryptocurrencies have been allowed to run the way that they have. And I think part of it is they want people to believe and to get comfortable with cryptocurrencies that these digital assets are, are real. And, uh, that's one of the reasons I think they haven't done anything with it to date. But I think that if they did, issue if the if the central banks of the world all start issuing digital currency those cryptocurrencies and there's lots of them not just bitcoin but lots of altcoins all around the place could very well become illegal like we saw in turkey and i'm not saying that will happen but i think that federal reserve and the u.s government do not like competition in the money printing game and uh, uh or the currency game not to say that that's really what bitcoin is but I think it, it's certainly um, certainly a possibility that the governments will will try to to uh, limit what people have the ability to do with uh, digital currencies. So to me, that's the biggest wild card for, for for personal digital currencies. But in terms of central bank, I think what's happening with the Chinese digital yuan is maybe the biggest event of my life because ultimately, I think it signals the end of the dollar as singular world reserve status. And I think that will change. I think that there will be a, a new kid on the block, uh, one that is going to be familiar to 70% of the human population. And if they back it with gold at some point, it's all over for the dollar. So I think the real question here, Elijah, is not how much gold and silver should one own. It's what exposure do you want to currency that's north of $120 trillion in debt and that is facing this kind of an uphill battle with a new strong kid on the block for the first time in a long time that ultimately has the ability to knock the dollar off the king of the hill. So I would say to everyone out there, keep your eye eastward and keep your eye on what's going on with the digital yuan. This is no small uh, news snippet. This is the real deal and it's a big deal. And uh, ultimately I think could, could reshape the way that uh, the world does business. All right. Well, Andy Sheckman, we really appreciate your time and insights today. If our viewers would like to contact us, they can call us at 1-800-822-8080 or email us at info at milesfranklin.com. Before we let you go, any last thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers? Yeah, I guess the, the biggest the biggest thing that, that comes to mind after this conversation is don't be directed by your emotions. Take a step back, see the tree. Don't look at or the forest, rather. Don't look at the individual trees. Don't be um, don't be moved by the emotion of, of volatility. That's what, that's what really the people pushing the price around count on. Instead, take a more measured, non-emotional approach and look at what the biggest money in the world is doing. And it's very obvious. They're draining all of the markets of physical metal. COMEX, London Metal Exchange, Shanghai Gold Exchange, massive deliveries. And uh, uh, this next delivery contract into May is one of the biggest ones yet. And uh, so I guess we'll see what happens, but stay, stay true to your beliefs and don't let uh, the emotion uh, of this roller coaster get you too high or too low and, and look, for the, uh, look for the continued debasement of the currency and the movement of the biggest money in the world to continue to shelter. Don't do what they're saying, do what they're doing. We'd love the opportunity to work with people uh, on a continued basis here where we're going to guarantee them the best price in the country, personalized service. And um, we're just honored to uh, have a relationship with you and your dad. 
Elijah, and, uh, and, and that all of our clients out there listening will give us a chance to continue to earn their trust in business. That means an awful lot to myself and to everyone here at Miles Franklin. Right back at you, Andy. And once again, thank you so much for your time. Have a great weekend and God bless. Thank you, Elijah. God bless you and have a great weekend. I'm uh, packing up the house here today. The movers are here today and tomorrow. And next time that I speak with you, uh, we will be uh, in our new home in Florida in Delray Beach. So uh, wish us luck and safe journey and uh, you have a great weekend. And I hope to talk with you uh, real, real soon. Stay well. Definitely. And I know you'll in, uh, you'll enjoy the warmth. I have definitely been enjoying the warmth during the winter here in Arizona. So, Well, you're, you're originally from Minnesota, too. So you know what we've had to deal with. Myself, 50 winters. That's, uh, that's one too many. Time to, time to move to a little bit of warmer sunshine and, and a different political structure. We'll save that discussion for another day. But uh, God bless you, too, buddy. Hope to talk to you soon. Great. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Elijah. Stay well. 